It's Summer Rewind again, and welcome back to messages that will transform your life and are worth repeating. To introduce tonight, I want you to ask yourself a couple of questions. What are your thoughts about the early church? Do we view them sometimes as super apostles? Perhaps it's easy to believe that they possessed qualities or gifts that we just can't seem to attain. While they were instruments of birthing the apostolic church and they modeled and recorded the directives of the Lord Jesus, I think sometimes we probably gloss over their humanity and romanticize that era. These comments aren't meant to belittle who they were or what they accomplished, but rather to open our minds to God's estimation of the modern church, what he's entrusted us with, and the possibilities just waiting for us when we grasp the truth of those two things. May God open your understanding and ignite all of us as we listen to this message, Ode to the Modern Church, by Danny Whitley, a pastor in Arkansas, who's preaching this to the saints of the Pamers Church in Ohio. Listen with a new perspective on the modern church to the Ode to the Modern Church. I'm going to read to you one passage from the book of Hebrews, chapter 2. And it's a familiar passage. We can probably all read it together. And it's very short. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 1. Therefore, by the way, Brother brother Paul uh, asked me, I'm a little self-conscious to preach this message because I preached it a couple places and I feel like everybody's heard it. But he told me you haven't. So here we go. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Amen. Um, we're going to exa- examine just for a moment uh, some things that took place over a period of about eight hours that took place uh, in the life of Jesus Christ and his followers just shortly after his passion. God bless you as you're seated. In John chapter 20, in John chapter 20, um, the scripture tells us that um, it was evening time on the first day of the week, and it says that the disciples were gathered in. This was after his crucifixion, and they were afraid. And the scripture says the, the doors were shut. It was They weren't shut because it was cold outside. Um, they were shut because these people were afraid. They had seen their leader murdered, and they felt certain that they were going to be somewhere in line to share in that fate. And so they had the doors shut. And the scripture says, if you were reading with us, and we're not reading right now, but it says in verse 19 that Jesus stood in the midst of them. Out of nowhere, he materialized in a room that was locked down. He materialized in the midst of them. This was after his resurrection. They uh, were just becoming acquainted with the resurrection. And so Jesus materialized in the midst of them, and he said, peace be to you. You, that is an intense moment. You have to really think about that. Sometimes when we read these words off the pages of Scripture, it just doesn't have the, the effect that it ought to have. You're in a locked room. You're scared out of your mind. The authorities, for all you know, are knocking on the door. And then the man who was just murdered a, uh, a few days ago materializes in your midst, and you're scared. And, 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 and if you read what Luke wrote about the exact same event, the Scripture says that they thought he was a spirit. They thought he was a poltergeist, a ghost that showed up of a dead man who had been murdered. And, and so when, when Jesus saw their fear, he said, peace, peace, peace be to you. And then he said, look at my hands. He said, look at my side where they pulled the spear out of my guts. And it says, and when the disciples saw it, they were glad. I think so. Come on, that's church, wouldn't you say? You're sitting there and Jesus materializes 
and he, he tells you, he gives you peace. He shows you his hands and his side, illustrating that he is a risen human being. The disciples were glad when they saw the Lord, the scripture says. And then it goes on to say that he went down the line and he breathed on them. He just breathed on them and said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Now, I don't know what happened there, if that was a prelude to the infilling of Acts chapter 8 or something happened at that moment, don't know. But he breathed on them intentionally and said, receive you the Holy Ghost. And we start reading in verse 24, but Thomas, one of the 12, called Didymus the twin, the word Didymus means twin, he had a twin brother or sister running around somewhere but not, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, we have seen the Lord. It wasn't a ghost. We saw the Lord. But he said, listen, there may be proof enough for you, and you may be back on the bandwagon already, but I, first time, shame on you. Second time, shame on me. I'm not falling for it. He said, except I see in his hands the print of the nails like you did, Yes, I've got to have the equal amount of proof that you had. He said, but I've got to take it to the next level. He said, I want to take my finger and ream out the holes in his hands. I have a greater burden of proof placed upon the Savior in order to gain my faith. He said, I've got to put my finger in the print of the nails and I have to thrust my hand into his side. That is, can we, can we agree here this morning that that's a little bit creepy? That, that's, that's ghoulish and macabre and grisly and dark. This man has been through some things, yes. This man has seen some injustice, but haven't we all? And he makes such macabre demands. He makes such dark statements. He said, I will not believe with anything short of this demonstration. And then it says, and after eight days, more than a week has passed, and again the disciples were then, and Thomas was with them this time. Then came Jesus, again, the doors being shut like they were eight days earlier. This time Thomas was there, and he stood in the midst like he did eight days earlier. And he said like he did eight days earlier, peace be unto you. Then he goes straight to Thomas. Leads us to believe that this second event, this second illustration, was specifically for one man. He, he repeats the same routine that he did eight days earlier, but this time he goes straight to Thomas. He said, reach hither thy finger, behold my hands. Jesus knows what Thomas has said. I don't know if the disciples have told him or he just understood it. But he goes straight to Thomas and he holds out his hand. He said, put your finger right there, boss. Reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side. That's heavy stuff. Incredibly, unimaginably, unbelievably, the Lord met those grisly demands. He accommodated them no matter how dark they were. He accommodated them. And here's what he said. He said, reach hither, reach hither thy finger. Behold my hands. Reach hither thy hand. Thrust it into my side and be not faithless. Jesus acknowledges here in Thomas that he's not dealing with struggling faith or he's not dealing with, with uh, flagging faith. He's dealing with no faith. He has no faith. He is faithless. Thomas, I'm here. I bring to you open, unhealed wounds for you to explore to your ghoulish satisfaction because I have decided that you will believe and I will not allow you to not believe. I will coerce you to believe. I will compel you to believe. You do not have the option not to believe. That's what the Lord was saying, because Thomas, Thomas spoke these, these demands of his, these dark, ghoulish demands, and says that's the standard that he will have to meet in order to, uh, to, to secure my faith. And the Lord said, okay, if that's what I have to do, shove your hand into my side. 
you're going to believe no matter what. I will not allow you to believe. And Thomas answered and said unto him, as he pulled his hand out from behind the veil, my Lord and my God. Jesus wasn't as happy maybe as Thomas was at that moment. He wasn't congratulating Thomas on this this, uh, proclamation. He just looked at him and said, Thomas, because you've seen, you believed. That's not, that's not a great achievement. You believe because you have seen. And then he said this beautiful statement that blesses my heart every time I read it or I hear it. He said, blessed are those, are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Blessed are those that have not seen. Thomas, sir, the situation with you is that I will force you to believe. I will not allow you to not believe. I do not accept your unbelief. Thomas almost proudly proclaims his unbelief. He declares it. He embraces his unbelief. He has owned his unbelief. Today, To this day, it's what he was known for, is his, for his proclaimed unbelief. But Jesus said, I'm sorry, I don't accept your unbelief. You're going to believe. I will compel you to believe. As as I mentioned in Luke chapter 24, it talks about they thought he was a spirit. And to persuade them that he was not a spirit, he said, how about some fish and some honeycomb? So he sat down with them in fellowship and consumed a physical meal with them in order to illustrate that I'm not a poltergeist. I'm a human being that's risen from the grave. He opened their understanding, the scripture says. If you, if you blend the things that John said and the things that Luke said, it's a pretty remarkable afternoon. You guys with me? It's a pretty remarkable afternoon. Tom, you take the things that John said and then you take the things that Luke said. Luke said that he went by and he said he just opened their understanding while he was with them there in that room. He opened their understanding. I don't know what that means. I'm 54 years old next week, and I'm still trying to figure things out. I'm still trying to understand the black ink on the white paper and what it's supposed to mean and what it's supposed to teach me. But these guys, these disciples become apostles. Never had to deal with that because one afternoon in a locked up room with open wounds, he went by and breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Ghost. And then he waved his hand over them and their understanding was open, the scripture says, to all things that were in the scriptures. You think in an afternoon that it all comes together for you and it all just becomes clear as a glass to you in one day. That all the disparate pieces of information of the prophecies of the prophets and the Psalms and the Pentateuch, all of those parts of scripture laying on the table unassembled. Jesus waves his hand over them and breathes on them and they all begin to click into place. And in a moment's time they could view the entire scheme of the word of God and understand it all. That is a beautiful thing. It says He breathes on them. says receive you the Holy Ghost. He opens the understanding and then he just turns and he walks away. And as he walks away they follow him. And he he keeps walking, and he keeps walking, and they keep following him. And he comes as far as Bethany. He turns toward them. And he lifted up his arms in a blessing, and he began to bless them. And as he blessed them, they just zipped him right up into the sky, and he was gone. (laughs) Now, come on. We've had some good demonstrations. We've We've seen some things that boost our faith, that that help our faith, that give us faith. But you've never seen anything like that. You've never had a Sunday morning like that in this church. Neither have I. And you never will. That ship has sailed. They saw things and heard things and experienced things and felt things that you and I will never have the ability or the opportunity to know. When the whole word of God comes together in a moment, when you see him zipped up into the sky and when you have your understanding open and he breathes on you and he shows you his wounds, that's a good day. You've had a good day in church when the Lord comes in and says, you're going to believe even if you don't want to. You're going to believe no matter what. I'm going to force you to believe. And he did that to those men. He would not allow them to not believe. But then he said to Thomas, You saw and you believe, but there are those out there in Barberton, Ohio, that have never seen what you saw today, but they will believe. 
and they're the ones that are blessed. Whatever blessings came with what you saw today, there's nothing to be compared with the blessings that are belong to those who've not seen. You are the blessed ones. It says, you may think the story ended there, but it didn't end there. The story goes on in verse 30. After all of that, after all of that that we just went down the line on, the scripture says in verse 30, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. After all those things that it just said that they saw, this, they said that was not even scratching the surface, that there were many other things that Jesus did in the presence of his disciples that are not written, that you don't even know about. The things that are written, you'll never get to see, you'll never get to experience, you'll never have those experiences. I'm sorry to break it to you, but you won't. You're among those that did not see. But if you took all those things that we do know about it and then you add on top of these that there are many other things that we don't know about. Not only did we not see them, not only did we not experience them, we don't even get to read about them. We don't even get the black ink on the white paper. We get nothing. They're just omitted. They've been left out. That's an, an incredible thing. He says in verse 30, these signs Jesus did in the presence of the disciples, they are not written. And then in verse 31, this is how the story is. He said, but these were written. It's not all of them. It's not even most of them. But the ones that were written were written. And they were written, why? So that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And in that believing, you might have life through his name. No, we don't have it all in this thin little volume. But we have enough, he says, to believe and to have life through his name. And we're the blessed ones if we can find the evidence in this comparatively small volume to have life. I'm thankful this morning to be in a church where we believe in the written word of God. And it's not exhaustive and it's not complete. So many things were left out of it. But if you're looking, there's enough written to believe that Jesus is the Christ and have life. We're not only not allowed to see those things or hear those things or experience those things. We're not even allowed to read those things. And those were the things that Peter used to validate his ministry. How do I validate mine exactly? Peter used this, he says in 2 Peter chapter 1. He said, for we, everybody say we. Who's we here? It's not me and you. It's not who the we is. He was talking... Peter was talking about himself and the other cool kids. The apostles, the ones that got to see everything, got to know everything, got to understand everything. He said, we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ. He said, but we, this is how he validated his ministry. This is how he, he gained credibility with his audience. And he said it every time he preached. Read the book of Acts. Every time Peter preached, he preached in Acts chapter 2 in Jerusalem. He preached in Acts chapter 3 in the synagogue. He preached in Acts chapter 5 at, uh, at before the council. He preached in Acts chapter 10 in Caesarea. Every time he preached, his line, his, 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 his byline, his reason to buy was we were witnesses. We were there. That's how he validated his ministry. He says this here. He says, we, we, we made known to you the power and the coming of the Lord Jesus. And it says, the coming of our Lord, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We were there. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard and we were with him. We, not you and me, but him and them. We, they were with him in the holy mountain. We also have a more sure word of prophecy. We, me, James, John. Matthew and the boys, we have the sure word of prophecy. 
And then he gives, finally he turns, quits talking about them, and he starts talking about us. We have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you would do well to take heed. As unto a light that shineth in a dark place, because you, you're not like us. You, you didn't get to experience what we get to experience. You didn't get to see what we saw. You live in a dark place, in a dark world. Here in 2019, we live in a world that is so secular and so postmodern and morality and norms have been so skewed that it's impossible to, to almost uh, even keep up with things and how they are declining. We're in a dark place in many of our lives and in our families and in our personal experiences. We're in a dark place. We lose loved ones and we have struggles and trials and addictions and hang-ups and dark things in our lives. And here we are fighting these things with all we have, without the knowledge, without it all coming together in an afternoon. We are fighting these things on sheer faith and grit. And Peter says... No, we saw all those things. We experienced all those things. And so we take our light and we shine it into your dark place and you would do well to take heed to it until someday, it won't be forever, someday the day will dawn and the day star will shine and rise in your hearts. You're in a dark place, but you have to make it on what you have. You got the little scraps that we decided to leave. We didn't leave most of it. In fact, John says in the 21st chapter of John, he said if all the things that Jesus had done had been written, he said that I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. There's a lot of books that should have been written, but they weren't written. We don't have them. We don't even have a clue what they were. We have this, comparatively small volumes filled with these and thou's and therefores and thou shalt nots, and it came to pass. And we dig around in that and we scratch around in that and we have ministers and people who have dedicated their lives to the study of this so that we can dig around in here to find something that would help us believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and in believing we have life. Do you understand what I'm telling you? We're the blessed ones. It may not appear at first glance that we are the blessed ones when they got to see everything and they got to know everything and we have to figure it out on the fly with a little light in a dark place. And we're, we're faced with the unenviable task of having to fashion for ourselves a faith that is able to withstand every assault of an increasingly hostile world. Our world is corrupt. It's replete with secularism and postmodernism that I don't even understand or know how to keep track of it, but I got to hold on to the ancient truths in a postmodern world, and we're doing all right, church. I look around this sanctuary today, and I see victors, and I see people who have overcome impossible odds, not having known or seen what those great apostles saw, but still, you're walking in the apostolic way. You're the blessed ones. I'm the blessed one. Do you understand that? Hallelujah. We are the blessed ones here. I was pre I'm preaching this message today, and I withheld my title to now, but my title, I'm going to break protocol with this title because I think we make our living, we make our living venerating the early church. We make our, 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 our living uh, telling of the legends of the early church and the apostles, and it's wonderful. It's wonderful. It makes great preaching. And we, we, we constantly glorify them. We lionize the apostles. We venerate the early church, and that's good. But I'm going to break protocol today, and I'm going to venerate the modern church. My, my title today is an ode to the modern church. We are the blessed church. We are the church that's living two millennia later on their revelations, on the things that they saw. We never got to shove our hands up in anything or ream out a nail print at all. We are here today putting the pieces together, the scraps left behind by the eyewitnesses of the majesty of his excellent glory. Here we are, 2,000 years later, serving the Lord faithfully. Give yourselves a hand right now and thank God for the modern church. Thank God that there's still a church at this address where we talk about the apostolic way. This is what we have and this is all we have and it's enough. 
The book of Acts starts out with this proclamation in the very first chapter, the third verse. After his passion, the scripture says in Acts chapter 1, verse 3, that he showed himself alive after his passion. And I want you to think hard about these three words. With many infallible proofs. Many infallible proofs. Listen. The believing of which requires no faith. Am I too loud? There were, again, many infallible proofs. They were proofs. They were infallible. They were inarguable. And there were many of them. And they were proofs. And there were many of them. And they were infallible. And they were proofs. You don't need faith when you have many unarguable, undebatable proofs. So no, they didn't have a choice. No, God, they were forced to believe. You and I don't have these infallible proofs. They operated their ministry on many infallible proofs, and I operate mine on a few debatable beliefs. I'm blessed because we have forged folks with the, with the aid of the Holy Ghost and with the aid of the ministry and with a little, little bit of grit in our gut. We have forged for ourselves a faith that has withstood Darwinism and secularism. We have forged a faith that, that, that has withstood postmodernism and hedonism. We have a faith today that has been forged with so much less than what they had. We're the blessed ones. Blessed are they that have not seen. I am glad to be a part of the modern church. It's equal to any church of any age, and we have nothing to hang our heads about. What we believe and the way we live requires immense faith. Thomas' demands were dark, but the Lord was willing to accommodate them. Outrageous and grisly, but the Lord said, nothing is too far to get my disciples to believe, but when it's said and done and when their belief is secured, I want to let them know something, that you're not the blessed ones. They are the blessed ones who put it all together with a few scraps and breadcrumbs that you left behind. They'll pick them up and they'll put them together and they'll study and analyze them until they can forge for themselves a faith. I revere those apostles, I really do. But again, what choice did they have? The things they knew, the things they taught, the things they did, the things they died for required no faith. In any comparison today, you are sitting and thinking about this, so it's all right. Any comparison, are you guys with me? Any comparison again, uh, between us today and the early church not a fair comparison. Any comparison today between our dear brother Rod right here and, and uh, the apostles is not a fair comparison. I, I, I've, I've kicked myself for years. I read that Bible and feel like I'm about two inches tall. I read about those apostles and the things that they did and the accomplishments, and I think I can't measure up. I, I look at Apostle Peter and I say, and I've kicked myself for most of my life because I'm not the Apostle Peter. The truth is I'm not the Apostle Peter, and I will never be the Apostle Peter. I can't be the Apostle Peter. I didn't see a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of what he saw, knew, experienced, and felt. No, I'll never be the Apostle Peter, but there's evidence in that book that the Apostle Peter could never be me either. Now, chew on that a while. Is there not evidence in that book that the Apostle Peter could never be Brother Rod either who could put it together and stay faithful to God for all of these years without all the, without all the revelation that Peter had, without all the infallible proofs? There's evidence there that he could never be me. So, church, take heart. The modern church is the church that Jesus died for, and it is the church that Jesus will come and receive to himself. And never hang your head. Never hang your head. 
Never be ashamed of the modern church. She is a wonder. She is a beauty. She is magnificent. And she's second to no one. The modern church, the modern church is equal to any church of any age. I spend my days begging for answers they never had to beg for. They saw the Lord. The scripture says, and we're glad. They saw all of those things that they saw, and the scripture says they were glad. Look at what Peter wrote, writes about us. They saw the Lord and were glad. He said, whom having, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8, whom having not seen, you love. In whom though now you see him not yet believing, you rejoice with joy. They got to see all of that and they were glad. We don't get to see it and we rejoice and we shout and we sing and we praise for weeks and months on end. And having not seen, we rejoice with joy, unspeakable and full of glory, full of glory. Oh, what a church we belong to. What a fraternity we belong to. What a wonderful group of people we have. Having not seen, we love him and rejoice like crazy in our dark places. We're doing more with less. It's not fair to compare us to the early church. It's not fair to compare us to the early church. And I think we've made the early church something that they never were. Oh, don't, don't backslide when I say this. They were a messed up bunch of people. They, there was no panacea. The early church was just as fouled up or more so than we are. Would you want to go to the Corinthian church? Would you? Do you want to go to the Corinthian church where they're sleeping with their mother? Nobody seems to think anything's wrong with it. Do you want to go to the Corinthian church where he said you're immature, you're even as babes? Do you want to go to the Corinthian church where they don't even believe in the resurrection and, and they so slaughtered the spiritual gifts that it's damaged their church? Do you want to go to the Corinthian church? I, I, I don't want to pattern my church up to the Corinthian church. We've made them into things that they never were. Do you want to go to the churches of Galatia where they were bewitched and had departed from the faith? Oh, foolish Galatians. Do you want to go to the Sardis church where everything is dead, Brother Nelson? Everything is dead and a few things left twitching on the floor are about to die. No, you don't want to go there. But I feel all right here. We're all right, church. The modern church is a beauty. The modern church is a wonder. And we're alive and doing well, thank you. We're doing more with less than anybody's ever done. I see you struggle with troubles and trials and unbelief that they never had to struggle with. Loved ones are taken from us and we're not consoled by miracles. We just have to go walk into the house of God and pray and worship until we get a stiff upper lip and the guts to go forward. And our lives are crushed and our plans are blown apart and disease will grip our mind and disease will grip our bodies. And somehow, with grace and with dignity and with honor and with steadfastness, we press forward inexplicably without all the proofs to great church. I see your dignity and I see your honor. And the truth is that you and I have been required to believe and to be saved and to be fruitful and to be effective and to be faithful with much, 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 much less than what they had. And folks, we're not doing too bad. We're building worldwide movements and we're sending missionaries around the globe and we're doing it on a pittance of truth. On fragments. So don't ever feel ashamed. You're doing what you're doing on that pittance of truth. Go to Acts chapter 2 and I'm, 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 I'm going to do my best to finish soon. Go to Acts chapter 2. The day of what? The day of what? Pentecost. Well, what are we? Pentecost. 
Well, you know what happened? The Holy Ghost fell, rushing mighty wind, so on, so on, so on, so on. What shall we do? Peter said 29 words. 29 words. Repent. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. There we go. And boy, have we taken off with those 29 words. We have built beautiful buildings like this one dedicated to those 29 words. We have evangelized the globe with those 29 words. We tucked those 29 words up under our arm and we changed the world. In a century, we, with those 29 words, the modern church changed the world, changed the landscape of religion. And then it says, with many other words, We got 29, and then he says, well, there were a lot more words that he told them how to save yourselves from this untoward generation. Folks, we don't even get Pentecost. We don't even get to read about Pentecost, let alone experience what they experienced. We get 29 words, and we are running the aisles with them when there were many other words telling us how to save ourselves from this untoward generation that they were omitted and they were left out. We don't even get Pentecost, but here we are, right here in 2019 in Barberton, Ohio, doing well, still screaming about the 29 words, still bringing people down to the altar, baptizing them in Jesus' name and being filled with the Holy Ghost. The 29 words that we were given are still enough. Many other words. And then he says, as many as received his word, what words? You mean the words we didn't get? Yes, those words. We got what we got, and we've made the most of them. Do you understand that? We're a flawed bunch. We have a lot of problems, a lot of warts, and a lot of hang-ups, but so does every church of every age. We're doing more with less than anybody's ever done in the history of the world. Here we are, somehow, here we are. Paul limited the things he wrote to far less than what he knew. Listen to what I'm saying here. Paul limited his teaching to less than he knew. And he limited his writing to less than he taught. And our reading has been limited to less than he wrote. In other words, he wrote some things that we don't have. And our understanding is limited to far less than we read. By the time you whittle it all down, we've just got to. Paul, let me, let me say that again. Paul limited his teachings to less than he knew. And I can prove that to you in the scripture. Look what it says in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I'm hurrying. I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. He said, I'm going to give you Jesus. And him crucified, everything else is omitted. I'm not telling you everything I know. I'm telling you the bare bones, bargain basement gospel message, and that's all you get. And that's all we got. But he said it's enough to believe and to have life through his name. We don't even get Pentecost, but here we are, Pentecost. Pentecost, still living, still praising, still shouting about the 29 words. We are here carrying the banner a beautiful thing. I just limited everything I know down to one sentence, Jesus Christ and him crucified. He says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, he was in a place, he had been stoned in Lystra, and he was left for dead, and it was about that time where Paul said, I had myself an encounter in the third heaven. Did Paul have a death experience? I don't know what he said, but I was in the third heaven. And I met a man who told me things up in heaven. It was a cosmic experience. I'm not even sure I was alive. He said, but he told me things that are not, are not lawful for me to utter. He told me, I've seen heaven and I heard things, but I can't tell you because it's not lawful. Well, could you forget the law just a minute and tell me what's on the other side of all this sorrow and suffering? Because you, you know things and you're not going to tell me. 
I know some of you have suffered through the hardest trials of your life, and you don't know what the other side looks like. See, the thing about you, Apostle Paul, is you never get to lay your head on your pillow again not knowing what heaven looks like, and you never, ever have to wrestle again with the question, is it worth it? Because you know it's worth it, because you've been there and you saw it, but you couldn't leave us the information. We have to muscle through. We have to... We have to dig down and find the faith in our dark place and our little light. We're blessed, church. You could have told me about paradise, but you didn't. You left me here by myself. But here I am. Here we are. While the rotting flesh falls from the bone of religion, here we are. The priesthood of Christ, my, my high priest and apostle of my profession. In Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 10 says, talking about Melchizedek, he was called of God. We're talking about Christ, who was called of God, a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. He said, of whom I have many things to tell you, but we're not going to tell you. You could tell me about my high priest. You could tell me about Jesus. You could tell me you have a revelation about my high priest who is my mediator and my sacrifice. And you won't tell me because 2,000 years ago they were dull of hearing. 2,000 years ago they didn't want to hear it. It means I don't get to hear it. So here I am in 2019 trying to put together the few pieces of information that I have. I don't even have information about Pentecost. I don't have information about Jesus Christ, my high priest. I am doing what I'm doing without all of this evidence. There's no infallible proofs. Black ink on white paper in a comparatively small volume. If you can go back into the world and you can serve, sacrifice, and live for Jesus, without all of that, I salute you and you are blessed. You have woven and fashioned for yourself a faith on the skeleton of evidence left behind by those eyewitnesses. And since then, that evidence, the evidence left behind in this book has been savaged by universities and scholars bogus intellectuals and soulless technocrats and, and everything in between by the media and Hollywood and high society and higher education and, and, and every high thing that's exalted itself against the knowledge of God has picked at this and picked at this and picked at this and picked at this, picked at this for 2,000 years. They have torn it apart. They have picked it apart. They have mocked it. They have scourged it. And here we are still digging through his pages, still believing and still having life through his name. Woo! A few things we have been given that we have to build our lives on completely in faith have been mocked and assaulted for 2,000 years, but here we are. Jesus talked and his disciples and apostles talked about the end times, said so they would be perilous, scoffers would increase, the love of many would wax cold, said they would not endure sound doctrine. There'd be phony teachers scratching itching ears. There'd be lovers of their own selves more than lovers of God. There would be a great falling away. All of these things are true. All of these things are true. All of these things are true. But they're not true because we're so close to the end. They're true because we're so far from the beginning. It's been 2,000 years since anybody ever touched Jesus. It's been 2,000 years since anybody ever heard his voice or seen his face. It's been 2,000 years since we ever heard a sermon by an apostle. We're so far from the beginning and people are fading away, but there's a group of people gathered here on a September morning that's hanging on and you're being faithful. Do you get that? Do you know what you are? Do you know how unusual and rare you are? You're blessed, you're blessed, you're blessed. And you are the church that Jesus loves. All of those things are true, not because we're so far, not because we're so close to the beginning, because we're so far from the beginning. Further than anyone has ever been. We're clinging to these ancient truths in this postmodern world. Don't you sell yourself short. You're a wonder, brother. I can get mad because I don't have everything they had 
or I could just give the more earnest heed to the things which I have heard. I don't need to get jump, jump ugly with the maker of the universe or get all sideways with the apostles because of the things they withheld. I don't need to pot, pout or make excuses. I need to hold more earnestly to the things which I have heard. Don't let a single syllable slip. We need to come to church. We need to be faithful. We need to provoke one another to loving good works. We do not need to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, and much more as we see the day approaching, because as that day approaches, we're getting further and further and further. We don't get to hear Jesus. We don't get to hear his disciples, so we better cling one to another. You need unity in your church. You need unity in your church. You need one spirit. Because you're alone in this world as this world swirls downward. You need to be in a church that preaches truth, that clings to the ancient truths in the postmodern world, and you better sell out to it and buy into it. I'll close. This next few minutes, I entitled this The Old to Modern Church, and so, and I'm sorry I'm a little late, I didn't realize. I want to give an ode to the young mother who sits on the edge of her child's bed and reads the stories from the picture book. While, they, while the, some, the neighbor's kids are gathered around the nerd phone, and they're talking, they're watching some filth, you get that book out and you read to them before they go to bed. That's what my mother did for me. That quiet, precious woman read stories to me about the Valley of Elah and the great giant that fell and the muscle-bound Hebrew who chased down the foxes. And for that little bit before I fell asleep, I was feeling the, the surge of Jehovah in my sinew. And I was forming, there was callings being formed in my life, and I'm thankful for that. You, you tell that boy and that girl those stories. You, I know your back hurts and your feet hurt, and it was a hard day, but you keep reading those stories and the weary pastors that, that manage this great edifice and this great congregation keep preaching the word of the Lord, and it's hard sometimes. It's hard to lift up your head and encourage people when sometimes you feel like you've been driven into the ground, but keep preaching that word. It is the life's blood of the modern church. Preach the word. I salute you. I salute you, ministers and teachers, musicians, and all of those who make the modern church go. My ode is to you. My ode is to the missionaries who are dropped over foreign lands, having sold everything they ever worked for in a yard sale so they could sit face-to-face -face in coach 35,000 feet above the ground cramming Portuguese, and they're not afraid. They just go boldly and stoically into that world. To the, to the man with the steel-toed boots in the factory or the nurse in the hospital or the 18-year-old in the paper hat working the drive through you come and you lick the envelope and you bet the first fruits of all your increase on the modern church. I salute you beautiful woman who goes out every day and models purity and decency and dignity and class in a world that demands objectification and sensuality. Don't you, ma'am, ma'am, listen to me. Don't you ever be ashamed of who you are. You have preserved something for all civilization that exists only in the world today because of you. You have preserved femininity and beauty and modesty and decency for a world that has abandoned it since the sexual revolution and you have preserved it for all humanity. Be glad. You're a member of the General Assembly and Church of the Firstborn who are written in heaven, the greatest fraternity that has ever existed on the earth. Never be ashamed. Never be ashamed. You give what you give and you do what you do so addicts have hope. So single mothers can come from nightclubs and dirty-faced children can have a ride to church and for the shut-ins and for the depressed and the addicted and the hopeless and for the wanderer and the stranger. You not only saved yourself in this mess, but you're reaching out to others. You're a wonder. You're a marvel. You're magnificent. You're second to no one. You gave me all I have. And I love you. Could you stand with me?
Would you turn around to somebody and grab their hand? Look at them and just say these three words. Here we are. So unlikely that we would be standing here 2,000 years later on the other side of history, hanging off the edge of history, so far from the beginning, no one would have ever dreamed. The apostles never dreamed we'd be here. They thought the end was coming in their lifetime. In 2,000 years, here we are. What a feat. What an accomplishment. What a beautiful thing. And we're not perfect. We're so far from it, but here we are.